But it's nice to, to see some people again. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I've been um, uh, away uh, working and reading and praying and preparing and writing and I've just had such an absolutely fantastic time. It's amazing what you can do when there's no interruptions. Is that not right? And uh, I've been uh, preparing and writing the next counseling course, uh, being transformed by the renewing of your mind and uh, going over good truths, old truths, looking at them again and seeing how we can be more effective in helping you move forward with Jesus. And so you'll be hearing all about that and in many ways what I'm going to share with you today in the message has come out of some stuff that I've been looking at and uh, God's been stirring me up about. Anyway, welcome, welcome to all of you and welcome to those who are watching live on the internet. May God bless you wherever you are, whoever you are, all over the world. You are very welcome as you join us now for our message. And over the road and the Coronet Cinema, welcome to Christian and all your people over there in the Coronet. And uh, God bless you and, and uh, touch you as we share together in the Word of God. Downstairs, also in the overflow, overflow behind me. Any place where you are flowing, overflowing, God be with you. I'd like just to uh, reinforce some of the uh, messages we've been hearing today. I'm looking forward to the cell celebrations in, in uh, King's Cross, Stratford, and then in Westminster Chapel. Westminster Chapel is our central area where we're going to really fully support. But if you live near Stratford, please feel free to go to that one as well. Or King's Cross area, that's a week on Tuesday. And uh, over these couple of weeks, God's been stirring up my heart about how we need to reach our city with the grace of God. You know, we are so happy in this building. And, and in many ways, it's a bit of a bondage because, you know, there are people outside the building. Do you know there is life in Christ outside of the 11 o'clock service? Did you know that? And there are people way out there that need Christ, that need to know the joy of the Lord. And uh, we have this mission to reach London for Christ. So we want you to be with us, celebrate with us, and meet some of the family. You know, 11 o'clock, do you know? Do you know? Are you, have you ever heard about that? People come out at 9 a.m. and worship God. And they're your family. They're the 9 o'clockers. They're not the 11 o'clock rockers like you. I know that, you know. They're a little more reserved. But they are family of God. There's also a 2.30 service and a five o'clock service and a seven o'clock service and a Saturday night service and a Friday night service and there are cells and celebrations and congregations all over London and there are family Kensington family that you've never even met come out find out who you are let's fill each of those venues as we take London with this message of God's grace also now next weekend is the annual leaders encounter and it's being packed with people from, from the network. And, but you see, Kensington Temple Leaders, lastminute.com. That's what I'm going to nickname you. So, Regis, this is your one chance this year as a cell leader to come and get filled and refreshed. The theme which I have set, and we've already done it amongst the primary leaders, is a heart after God. All year round, cell leaders, you are on the other end of the telephone. You're always ministering and preaching and teaching and counseling and visiting. Now is your opportunity to drink in and to receive, having been given out, giving out. Don't mess it. Don't miss it. Yeah, don't mess it. Don't miss it. Or you'll mess it. No, I ah, forget that. Let's, can I rewind that? Can I do another take? Don't miss it this weekend. So register now. The stewards are thrusting. Uh, registration forms in your hands. Bruce is going to be leading it and one of our uh, great satellite leaders, uh, Samson Essien, will be leading that. So sign up. You need this time with God. Amen and amen. Now you know about the rest of the day, 2.30 service, more than enough grace by Gabriel Chan. 2.30 service. 2.30 service is really steaming ahead and I know you want to be part of that. And at 5 o'clock, Bruce is continuing his series, his teaching series and the teaching service, getting rid of religion. Is that a good idea? Now, this is the, yeah, some of you say, yeah. How many people say, yes, get it? Now, we believe that, but we know what we mean. Because some people say, get rid of religion includes get rid of Jesus. We don't. 
We think Jesus is not religion anyway. Relationship with a loving God through Jesus Christ who sacrificially gave his life. I better stop because I'm preaching already. So that's at the five o'clock service. And uh, um, uh, we have our Holy Spirit revival service with Roberts Leden tonight. And don't forget Wednesday and Thursday, the teaching and training that we're doing. I don't know any church in London or any church anywhere in the world for that matter. I know I'm biased, but I don't know any church that offers as much teaching and training opportunities to, to form people, to shape people, to prepare people for the rest of your life. So sign up. You'll be glad you did, and you'll miss it if you miss it. All right. So that's, that's this. Wow, what a, what has I got here? The deeper life. Ah, that sounds familiar. It should sound familiar because it was my last series here. Colin Dye four-part series calls us to examine ourselves to ensure our spiritual sustenance is being found in the unmerited favor of God's kingdom and not the unsatisfying and eventually poisonous treasurers of this passing world well it's worth getting the DVD set just to read that again the deeper life the tree of wisdom when God says no I remember remember that message pretty good when the preacher remembers the message isn't it <laughs> when God says no times when we wish, wish God would say yes and he says no and we say why and he said tell you later in the meantime love me anyway <laughs> alright that's the whole message you don't need to buy it now because I've just preached it and uh, other messages there that was our last series this morning I'm starting a new series a new series uh, entitled Life Savers. Life Savers. And the first message in the series, you must be born again. Turn to the person next to you and say, you must be born again. <laughs> now that's, that's, that's very polite and liturgical. Say it again as if you're the preacher. I ordain you the preachers. You must be born again. <laughs> ah, that's what I like. It. Up there in the balcony, let's hear you. You must be born again. Now what does it mean to be born again? And why are we looking at a topic like this Sunday morning? Because I would say the majority of people are born again in this building today. How many people are born again? Let's see your hands. All right. But you know, why is it so important? And why am I taking you back to some of the basic stuff? You know, I'm speaking to you uh, prophetically from the background of prophesying about storms that are going to hit the spiritual life of Britain and storms which have already begun to burst upon our lives as individuals and we need to know how to ride out the storm in the presence of Jesus so that we do not make shipwreck of our faith and these last couple of weeks as I've been thinking and praying about how to help believers who are struggling with problems a counseling ministry to believers uh, over and over again it occurred to me that so many problems that we experience as believers is because we had a bad beginning we never understood from the very beginning what repentance is what faith is what trusting Jesus is we never looked at the small print of the entrance to the kingdom of God and many people believe that surrendering your life to Christ is gonna be steak on your plate and pie in the sky when you die all that is true but at the same time Christianity is not an escapist philosophy it's we, 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 we actually have to go through problems and we got to prepare for that stuff and got to know that we are rooted and grounded in love we got to know that we've met Jesus I'll tell you friends I've been through things in my life and I'm, I'm not exceptional that's for sure I've been through stuff in my life difficult stuff that if I did not know and know that I know and know that I know that I know that I am saved that God has met me and it is well with my soul no matter whatever else happens around me I would not have made it and you wouldn't be looking at me today and it's the same for every single one of us we need to understand what are the the real centralities the foundational stuff the stuff that we don't hardly preach about because we assume when was the last time you heard me preach about 
how to be born again especially in a service which is a bunch full of wonderful believers what's that all about you need to know what being born again means you need to know how to draw on those reserves of God's renewed nature in you so that you can bear fruit in your life and show the world that you are saved you know I heard see on the newspapers this morning I'm talking about the Sunday Telegraph which is a pretty substantial paper how that our government seems to be abandoning our rights as Christians and it's wonderful the government will stand up for all kinds of rights of different minority groups praise God for people and their rights uh, but when Christians want to take to the court of human rights in Europe the fact that our rights are being taken away from us that we cannot wear a cross to work for example uh, then we'd hope the government would say yeah let's stand up for some Christian rights but our government is saying no you have no right to wear your cross at work that's what our government is saying pray for them pray for them hmm that's not my topic today in fact I want to go a little deeper than that when I was saved I was saved in the in the Jesus revival or the ends of the Jesus revival 1971 Oh, no. <laughs> one or two people I guess were alive uh, just by some indication from the outside of you something uh, but many of you were not the Jesus revolution the Jesus revival was a move amongst the hippies and the young generation in the in the in the 60s and, and early 70s and I, w I came in on, on that revival and I remember becoming a Christian I thought I'm gonna let everybody know I'm a Christian so I went and bought a little cross a nice little gold cross, not a crucifix, not Jesus hanging there, he's not dead, he's alive, but an empty cross, you see. There am I, wearing this. And I go to this meeting, and this guy, I mean, he was so saved. He was so saved. He, was, he looked like a hippie, he was a hippie, but he was a Jesus person. There he was, he was, he was, he wasn't high on that kind of, he was high on Jesus, you know. No high like the great high, the, you know. No high like the most high. That's, he was like, you know, he looked at my cross and he said, oh, why are you wearing that, man? I said, because I love Jesus. He said, you love Jesus? You need to wear a cross to show you love Jesus? I want the world to know that I love Jesus. He said, you want the world to know that you love Jesus? He turned to his little psychedelic New Testament and turned to the scripture and said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen and amen. I'm going to keep on arguing for our right to wear a cross to work. But I'll tell you something more important than that. We need to show Jesus by our life. We need to show them that Jesus is alive. And he's living in us. And there is fruit in this tree. Amen. And they can see that, that there's something different about us. Now, it's not that we have to behave differently in order to prove to ourselves that we're saved. Or to prove to somebody else that they're saved, that, that we're saved, or even to prove to God, look God, I must be saved, look at all the good things I'm doing. Our assurance rests in one thing. We have transferred our trust from ourselves and placed it into Christ. When you stand on that door, the big one, the doorway to heaven, you can be trusting in one thing, you're going to say, I'm sure you've got my seat reserved here because of my place, your mansion, and all the rest of it. And why do you suppose that? Well, you know, I, I was you know, surprised you don't recognize me. I was the, the pastor of uh, Kensington Temple for all those years. Yeah, you were, yeah. I preached a minimum of 3,000 sermons. Yes. No, that's, that's not adequate. It's whether you trust Christ. Whether you say, Lord... I know that there's nothing here that will merit entrance into heaven because there isn't anybody good enough. In fact, the Bible says there is none good. No, not one. Only one. Only one was good enough. And his name was Jesus. He took our sins in his own body <laughs> and we could be saved. And this is what being born again is all about. Now, most of you will know some of this. Some of you won't even have never heard of this kind of stuff because we don't talk about it so much these days. We assume it. When I was saved, 
Billy Graham's book, Peace with God. Billy Graham's book, How to Be Born Again, was the big Christian reading of the day. And now it's about how to get rich quick and call it faith. And all that's what's happening now. You know, how to feel good and and all that kind of stuff. But we've got to get back to the good old-fashioned Bible understanding of what it means to be saved and to be born again. Okay, let's turn to John chapter 3. Are you ready? Are you with me? Okay, John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? John's Gospel chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 describes exactly what Jesus was talking about. John picks it up in the prologue to his Gospel. He said, he came unto his own and his own did not receive him verse 12 but as many as received him to them he gave the right the privilege the honor the authority to become children of God and this is it who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but born of God are you born of God really really born of God is God your father a lot of people say we don't need God today reminds me of the story of a young girl who is reading she's not reading she can't read yet but she's looking at the pictures in a picture book and she's looking at pictures and she's asking mummy questions and first question was mummy where do babies come from the stork darling replied the mother obviously she was too young to know the facts so the stork satisfied with the answer little girl returned to her book but a few minutes later looked up and asked her mummy mummy who keeps bad people from robbing our house the police darling answered the mother the girl returned to her book, but seconds later she asked, Mummy, if a house was on fire, who would rescue us? Oh, the fire department, darling, said the mother. The girl went back to her book, but then asked, Mummy, if I'm sick, who will make me better? The doctor, darling, said the mother. The girl continued looking at the picture in her book for, and asked, Mummy, where does our dinner come from? The butcher, darling, said the mother. Then the girl closed the book and said, Mummy, what do we need Daddy for? <laughs> well, a lot of people look around and say, what do we need God for? I don't need God. You know, I've got everything I need. If I'm sick, I go to the doctor. I want a job. I go to the employment agency. I don't need God. 
But the truth is, every single one of us needs God in this more than in anything else. We need God to give us life and become our Father. Because Jesus said, unless you are born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Ain't that the truth? So many people have no idea what we're talking about. You say, well, I'm in love with Jesus. God, God? what? Who? What are you talking about? Oh, how nice for you. Okay, move on to the next question. Jesus said, you must be born again because without being born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's why I want to talk to you about this. It's one of the first great truths that I want to look at in this build up to Easter. Four of them we're going to look up and then we'll come to Easter Sunday. Not very far away. And this is, you must be born again. Why is this so important? It's important because it's a life saver. This is a life saver. Now, you know, many times um, I talk to you about diving. It's one of my interests, a hobby. In fact, I'm a, I'm a professional. I'm a, I'm a dive instructor. I'm a rescue diver. And I could rescue you if you're in trouble, but I have to throw you in the water first and throw you out. Anyway, that's another whole story. And that's genuine. That's not fake. But when I say, look, you know, I'm a biker, that's uh, bending the truth a little bit. What that means is I have a nice BMW RT bike. It's not one of these, you know, crazy things. It's sort of one of, the, one of those, one of those bikes. Wonderful. And uh, it has stereo sound, very nice. Uh, it has no umbrella, so if it's raining, I don't take it out. So I'm a fake biker, because if you're a biker, you're an all-seasons all thing. But I do remember this. In the training from the very, very beginning. How many people ride a motorbike? Any people? How many people know this? You've done your... A few of you. Hmm. Okay. All right. From the very beginning, they say, now remember, don't ever forget the lifesaver. The lifesaver. What's that? It's looking behind you before you pull out. It'll save your life. Lifesaver. And they drum that up into you over and over again it's safety first life saver a life saving maneuver what I'm teaching you today is a life saver it's a life saver because without it you're finished it's as simple as that and that's why Jesus didn't enter into great theological debate this guy Nicodemus he was not just a, a, a teacher, he was the teacher of Israel. What does that mean? I mean, he was at the top of the top of the top of the theological ladder. This guy what, knew everything. You know, what, what he didn't know was obviously not worth knowing as far as he was concerned. He knew everything, but he didn't know the basic. He didn't know the basics. He didn't know from the Old Testament that God said, there's only one way. You need a new heart. You need to be washed. You need to be clean. You need to have that heart of stone removed and a new heart given to you. A new heart. That's the only solution. It's exactly what Jesus meant when he says in Matthew 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its bad fruit. Uh, uh, and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. And so, hey, that's it. This is why this teaching is not very popular. Because it says, hey guys, what you've got to understand is that in you, in your flesh, no good thing, nothing. You can't reform it, you can't change it, you can't make it religious and acceptable to God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And no substitute will do. Nothing else will do. God says the only way is to get rid of that old life altogether. To rip it out, deal with it, and give you a brand new life. A new heart. A new spirit within you. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about this. Now, interesting how Nicodemus was religious and had a place for Jesus. Oh, we know. We know that you must be somebody special because nobody could do the things that you do unless God were with him. We know you are. You sure? Well, why are you sneaking up on me in the dark then? Why are you ashamed to come out and talk to me in daylight? Well, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed to be seen with you, Jesus. 
That's how a lot of religious people go on, you know. It's, it, it, they, they, they enjoy talking about God and they'll even have a place for Jesus. Yes, we think he's a great moral teacher and we, we rather like his example and you can make Jesus anything you want him to be. He can be a revolutionary, he can be a middle class suburban person if you wish him to be. He can do anything you want him to be. You can make Jesus in your image. But Jesus says, hey, Nicodemus, you must, you must, you must be born again. Nothing else will do. And uh, there's a, a, a kind of term for this. Uh, it, we, we use the term regeneration, which means being born again. Being born again. And there's a word that comes before that unregenerate unregenerate somebody that is not born again unregenerate now that's almost an insult because it sounds a bit like degenerate doesn't it and so this is the first hurdle you've got to get over you've got to say listen guys you've got to understand this there's something in you that's not good there is none good no not one our hearts are really deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it and there's no way that you can get around that and I think this is why this doctrine is a bit embarrassing. And I've noticed in recent days, not many people preaching on it. In fact, I know of at least one major evangelical Bible teacher who doesn't even believe in it. Doesn't even believe in it and beginning to teach that it doesn't exist. It's, it's not what we made it to be. But I'm here to say Kensington Temple will continue to believe in Jesus' words. You must be born again. It's the only way that you can find your destiny fulfilled. It's the only way that you can enter into the family of God. It's the only way to be born again in the name of Jesus. The Bible says those that are in the flesh cannot please God. I want to show you a couple of scriptures which are quite, quite astonishing. Are you with me? Are you ready now? When I'm, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to those in the gallery. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17. All right. Okay, we got it. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. He's talking about unsaved, unbelievers, people who may be very religious but don't know Christ. Then verse 18. Oh, end of verse 17 goes on to say, the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Can you see how it starts to get difficult to listen to? Because it sounds so insulting we're saying you're unregenerate you're blind you're ignorant and your thinking is futile and your understanding is darkened you want to be able to say hey, I want to go to that church I want to go to that church oh, but you know I'll tell you something the people who are perishing I'm not going to argue about their condition when that helicopter comes I'm going to say let's hide hello what are you doing here We've come to rescue you. Rescue us? Why do we need rescue? You're about to drown. No, we're not. Life's okay. Any pity for us, dear? Is that how people, that's how people behave. They don't know that they're perishing. But thank God for the Holy Spirit who can convict us of sin and know that there is none righteous, no, not one. And you know what the test is? The test is whether you believe in Jesus. That's the test. If you have a look in John's Gospel again. Uh, just give me a moment. Yeah, John's Gospel chapter 16. I'm going, I'm jumping all over the place. I'm just following a different order here. John's Gospel chapter 16. Have you got it? I haven't. <laughs> Where is it? These jolly iPods. What are they? iPads. <laughs> yeah, there it is. John's, John 16. Is that what I said? 
I was right. Verse 8. All right. This is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. Please edit that out of the final DVD. I don't want to look ridiculous in front of the rest of the world. Amen. Okay. <laughs> and when He has come, who? The Holy Spirit. When He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9. Of sin because they do not believe in me all right stop right there think about these words picture it here's Jesus speaking to his disciples and he said I want you to know the Holy Spirit's coming and when the Holy Spirit comes this is what he's going to do he's going to bring conviction on the world people who don't know God he's going to bring conviction strong word Conviction. Conviction of, first of all, their sin. Okay. You got the picture? Now listen to what he says next. And this is how we know whether somebody is living in sin. Whether they believe in me or they don't. Now, for us, we know Jesus is the answer. Amen. Who was crucified on the cross, boys and girls, for us? Jesus, who was raised again on, this, on Easter Sunday? Jesus, who loves us? Jesus, we know this. But imagine, imagine anybody saying, you are going to go to heaven or hell, depending on whether you know me or you don't know me. That is heavy. Uh, I'm going back to 1960 now. That's heavy, man. That really is. How can anybody say, Oh, we like Jesus. He's such a wonderful teacher. No. Listen. It's got to be more than that. Because, you see, who would have the audacity, who would have the arrogance to say the whole of your spiritual destiny depends on whether you know me or you don't know me. Whether you believe in me or you don't believe in me. No man could ever speak like that and be right unless he is the Son of God. This isn't about, oh, what options we've got? We've got Confucius, we've got Buddha, We've got Krishna, we've got Mohammed, we've got Karl Marx, and all the rest of them. And let's have a look at this Jesus fellow as well. No, 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 no. Not even Adolf Hitler, in all his ego egocentric megalomania, said that. But here we have Jesus, a man who was honored by everybody as a good man, a man of Power, a man with integrity a man that even religious leaders had to say we know there's something about you we don't know what but there's something about you there's not just something about Jesus friends either Jesus is Lord and the Savior of the world or he is a liar this is serious isn't it so can it really be that the whole of your destiny depends on knowing Jesus. And this is what drives people mad. It's true. Because you see, unregenerate people are going to go. Saved people are going to say, it's amazing. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen? The others are going to say, I don't understand this. Well, of course you don't. Of course you don't understand it. And I'll tell you why you don't understand it. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are you ready for this? Up there in the gallery. 2 Corinthians. <laughs> I'm speaking to the person operating the screen here just because they're not going to follow me from what I gave them earlier. 2 Corinthians 4. Okay. Let's look at verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4. Whose minds the God 
of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Can you see the darkened state of the natural, unregenerate human mind? That which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. We're talking about a total inner transformation. A regeneration in which darkness is turned to light. Then, let's go on. It's still in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. And here it is, verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is that? That's a miracle. That's a miracle. They laugh. You say, Ooh, you've seen the light. She's seen the light. What do you mean? She's going to church. She's seen the light. I'll tell you something. There is light we need to see. Because in our natural state, our minds are darkened. Our understanding is darkened. So It's so dark. Our minds are so confused, we're so blind, that we couldn't see the truth, even if the truth came up and smacked us in the face. But God, the God of the first creation, who when there was darkness on the surface of the waters, spoke these words, let there be light, and there was light. That same God has spoken light of the gospel and recreated us from the inside out that's what it means to be born again hallelujah you know that which is born of the flesh remains flesh but being born from above means that it's not something we've worked out in our mind it's nothing to do not being born of blood not natural procreation or generation not by the will of man it was not something that human beings initiated but born from God, new life from God. It's an encounter with Christ in which you recognize Him for who He is and you transfer your trust from yourself to Christ. And you become born again. Hallelujah. I mean, it's glorious. I mean, this is so basic and so fundamental. That, you know, frankly, preachers are embarrassed talking about it because everybody's saved. But there are people in this building today who do not know Christ. There are people here who are not born again. And you need to be born again. And each one and every one of you has friends and relatives and people that you meet every day who are not born again. And they need to be born again. If Jesus said you must be born again. Something very important, isn't it? Poor old Nicodemus. He didn't know what Jesus was on about. He said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you expect me to get back inside my mother's womb? I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. How can this be? See, he was thinking natural thoughts. But this is supernatural. It's what makes Christianity, Christianity. It's supernatural. You know, somebody said... Uh, some time ago I remember quoting it said that God has no grandchildren Have you thought about that no grandchildren because his children are his children and you can only become a child of God by God's power in other words you don't inherit Christianity from your parents you need to be born again you can be brought up in a Christian home you can know the gospel inside out you could know the Bible as well as Nicodemus you could be a graduate from theological college 
You could even be a professor in theology. You might as well be a professor of geology for all good it will do to you unless you actually are born again by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So let's help Nicodemus out a little bit. So Nicodemus did not have the Gospels, all right? He only had the Jewish Bible, Jewish scriptures of that day, which included two prophets, one by the name of Ezekiel and the other by the name of Jeremiah. Okay, let's have a look at Ezekiel chapter 36. I want to show you from the Old Testament scriptures that Nicodemus should have known about this. He was not just a teacher. He was the teacher of Israel. So it's clear that religion cannot do it. And we can't argue and say, well, you know, the Old Testament, they believed in the God of the Bible, Jehovah. Amen. Hello. It's the same God. There are other religions that don't teach the same God that we teach. But at least Nicodemus could talk about God, the God of the Bible, but he didn't know the God of the Bible. And he should have known, because there it was in the prophets. Have a look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Are you ready? Verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. Oh, wow. That reminds me of the story of my friend Gerald Coates, who was on a radio interview panel with a number of people, some secularists, some humanists, including some lady who's no longer on this, in this planet now, so I won't give, give uh, her name, who was the, the great agony aunt of the generation. And this lady, she hated Christians, so especially evangelical. She should never say evangelical, evangelical Christians. And Gerald was waxing eloquent and having a good time, and she stopped. She said, Oh, you make me sick, you evangelicals. You're just nothing but brainwashing us. You're brainwashing yourself. You're brainwashing your children. You're brainwashing. You want to brainwash, brainwash. And instead of trying to defend himself, he said, Oh, how absolutely right. You're so astute. We are washing our brains. But we're washing our, what we're washing our brains with is a jolly sight cleaner than what you're washing your brains with. People of God, we need not just our brains washed, but we need a spiritual cleansing. And God says, I'm going to do it. You cannot do it yourself. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from every sin. Amen. Back to the prophet Ezekiel then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols and here it is verse 26 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh now this isn't stinking flesh this is meaning a heart that is soft and sensitive and responsive to God. God will do it. He will give us a new heart. Verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You'll keep my judgments and do them. What a wonderful prophecy. And this is what Jesus was referring to when he said, Unless you are born of water and spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Being born of water is not about church rituals, infant baptism, or any kind of thing. It's about being sprinkled with the cleansing, purifying water of Jesus Christ. Being born of water and being cleansed by water and also having the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Let's rush over to Jeremiah chapter 31. Another similar passage. Jeremiah 31 verses 33 to 34. Are you keeping up with me? Okay, verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. 
and I will be their God and they shall be my people no more shall every man teach his neighbor every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more that's what it means to be born again wow it's wonderful it's amazing so how do you get born again you get born again by transferring your trust from yourself to Christ it's like when the helicopter comes and that lifeline comes down you grab it you grab it and he rescues you it's an event it's something that happens to you has it happened to you have you grabbed that line now let's talk about what happens to you when you do that it's wonderful the first thing that happens to you is that you're saved you have a new destiny beforehand your destiny your future was not very bright eternally separated from God we don't want to go there believe me we don't want to go there but you have a new destiny that means you are assured of eternal life and whatever else happens to you you know it is well with my soul a new destiny a new destiny this short life on this earth ça ne dure pas longtemps il quelques années après ça quoi this life only lasts for a short time after that what but a new destiny do you have the assurance in your heart that if you died today you'd go to heaven that assurance can only come from transferring your trust from yourself to Christ a new destiny secondly a new direction I like that a new direction what this means is you have a whole new orientation it's not actually saying look look how clever you are look look how far you've traveled it's like which direction are you going in and that's the most important thing the Bible calls that repentance you ch change direction the whole of your life is reorientated and you're going in the opposite direction a new direction praise God for the new direction of life and you may be three steps along the way and somebody 23 steps ahead of you looks back and says oh look at you you're not as good as me you, you can do to them that's what you can do to them it's nothing about how far you've traveled it's where you're coming from and what your direction is don't let anybody look down on you if you're a lover of Jesus Christ you're going in the right direction you're saved hallelujah amen and amen a new direction a new orientation of your life you're facing Christ of course you will blow it you will blow it of course you do there's nobody perfect that's why the, G, the Bible says the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing you thank God amen a new direction thirdly a new dynamic in your life a new destiny a new direction and a new dynamic in your life what you have inside you is the very life of God and that's that that means your heart is changed what does it say second Corinthians 5 verse 17 therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a what a what Come on, preach it, preach it now. A new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. 
all things have become new. Christ is in you. That's your hope. That's what's changed. And you know, all the kind of things that you try to say to your non-Christian friends, you know, well, you surrender your life to Christ. Oh, if I do that, it means I'll have to go to church, have to read my Bible, I'll have to stop smoking, I'll have to stop doing all these kind of things, and I enjoy them so much, I'm now, I won't be able to keep it up. So listen, I used to be like that, but something changed. Now I want to go to church if you want to call it that I want to read my Bible I want to live for God remember a story told to me by a doctor friend of mine who practiced medicine in Penang the island of Penang in Malaysia uh, Dr. Joy Sivaratnam and uh, he was called in as a Christian to go and pray for a man who was dying in hospital dying in hospital very very wealthy man smoking his cigar they are taken one leg off because of his infection about to take the other leg off he's, his life expectancy was zero and Dr. Joy went and pleaded with him give your life to Christ he said what? you mean I'll have to give up smoking my cigars? will I have to do that? I won't be able to have a brandy? oh I'm not, I couldn't possibly keep it up you got nothing left to keep it up with. <laughs> what you talking about? What you talking about? The doctors are giving you a week. And you say, no, I've got too much life to live. This goes to show you that this is not just a matter of mental intellectual choice and rational thinking. This is a spirit of bondage that grips us. But when we come to Christ, it's broken. Amen. Amen. It's broken. We have a heart for God. We have a desire for Jesus and we blow it. Sometimes we double deluxe blow it. Anybody ever blown it in their life? Anybody ever blown it? But thank God, He knows about that. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Amen. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, He will provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Hallelujah. God is with you. He's going to help you. He's going to not just walk with you, but He's living within you. It is Christ in you. That's what it means to be a Christian, a Christ in person. Amen. And then suddenly, well actually, sorry, back it up, not suddenly, gradually, slowly, painfully, the fruit begins to appear. Poco a poco, little by little. Who are any Portuguese speaking people here? Or Spanish, it's the same language in my mind. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me encourage you today. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. You can't bear good fruit until you're born again. But when you're born again, with or without a cross around your neck, they're going to see your good works. And they're going to glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's give Jesus a big praise. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It would not be right to finish the service without inviting people who are not born again to get born again. If today you don't know whether you are born again or not, or today if you say, no, I'm not sure. Or today you say, no, I've never received Christ into my life. Today is your day. The rest of us, we're going to pray for you. And we're rejoicing in our salvation. But we want to be here with you like spiritual midwives. So that when the Father gives you new life, you're going to find that there are people here who are going to help you and stand with you as newborn 
babes in Christ. Hallelujah. And all it is is to recognize, dear God, I'm a sinner. And the greatest sin is keeping Christ out of my life. But today, I want to repent of that sin. I'm no longer going to keep Christ out of my life. I'm going to transfer my trust from myself to Christ. I'm going to receive Him and the new life that He offers. If that's you, I want you to pay a special attention to the prayer that I'm about to pray because I want you to repeat it after me. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody to repeat it after me, but I'll be giving it especially for you so that you can say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior today. Is that right? Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is the prayer. Everybody pray loud and strong, every part of the building, out there on the internet, over the road, in the coronet, downstairs, behind me, wherever you are, under the sound of my voice. Here's the prayer. Repeat it after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you now and I confess that I have kept you out of my life. But I repent and I invite you to come in. I transfer my trust from myself to you. And I thank you for dying on the cross, for carrying my sin, and for saving me right now. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There is the sound of people being born again in this place in the Spirit. If you prayed that prayer and you need Christ in your life and you want Christ in your life, I want you to lift your hand right where you are. I'm going to pray for you before we finish this service. Somebody's going to give you something to look after you right now. You need Jesus. Lift that hand quickly. Don't delay. Jesus said you must be born again. Thank you. God bless you to my right. Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you to my left. Thank you. God bless you. Upstairs in the balcony, lift your hand if you need Christ in your life. Jesus said, you must be born again. Believe Him. He didn't waste His breath. He didn't waste His time. He came a long way to deliver this message and paid a high price that we could receive Him. Lift your hand to say, Jesus, I need you. Amen and amen. Downstairs in the lower hall, overflow. There's somebody there for you across the road, Christian. You're in good hands with Him. Father, we pray for every person who's lifted their hands that as they have received Christ, they have the assurance that they have been born again. We thank you for this wonderful truth, this life-saving truth. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And the Father causes us to be born again through faith in Him. And Father, for every single one of us, we pray that you would strengthen us in this truth that we would go out into the, w the week that this world will give us knowing it is well with us all and let that overflowing joy reach out to others let them see Christ in us and desire Him in Jesus name Amen and Amen give Jesus a big mighty praise God bless you